Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Irrigation in the Environment, uh, another event uh, brought to you by B-Link Innovation. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're excited for an incredibly insightful event uh, with our guest speaker, Elizabeth Soule. Uh, now, before we get started, um, just want to let you know, my name is Julia Henson. I'm the Communication and Events Manager here at B-Link, Hipuna Karakari. I'll be your host for this morning. Uh, so we are B-Link Innovation, a part of Lincoln University. We specialise in the facilitation of innovative ideas, not only in Canterbury, but nationwide. One of our main points of difference is a far-reaching audience and a collaborative nature to ensure that New Zealand has the best possible outcomes in terms of environmental sustainability and native efficiencies. Just onto a little bit of housekeeping before we get started on this morning's event. This webinar will be recorded and sent out to you after the event. This means that you can spend time listening and thinking about questions rather than feverishly taking notes. There'll be a Q&A session following our speaker, Elizabeth. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen rather than the live chat function so I can pose those questions on your behalf. There's also a thumbs up button next to each question. The more each question is upvoted, the more the question will be prioritized. And as a default, all participants are muted and all webcams are switched off. If you see anything or hear anything that you'd like to share on social media, please don't forget to mention us with our handles um, on the screen there. We want to make sure our events and the ideas that come out of them are as far reaching as possible. So let's get social. So into the event, there are two main ecological apprehensions around irrigation, the accessibility and availability of water and the consequences of obtaining it from natural resources and nitrate discharge correlated with heightened livestock totals or crop production on irrigated acreage. Irrigation approaches have progressed significantly from wild flooding in central Otago to border dike systems. Scientific research has concluded that nitrate leaching is far less of an issue from spray irrigation methods than flood irrigation methods. And in light of this, we still have a lot of learnings to be had about irrigation to ensure that we're not only continuing to protect bodies of water from desolation, but also continue to reduce water, run water runoff into streams and lakes. We're very lucky to have independent freshwater policy and governance specialist Elizabeth Soule join us this morning. We will hear her perspective on how irrigation in New Zealand is changing, how perspectives on irrigation are changing and how it's impacting our environment. We'll also hear what she believes success in irrigation and farming systems in Canterbury might look like and the innovations on the horizon to further improve the impact on the environment from irrigation. So with all that being said, please let me introduce you to Elizabeth. Having previously been the Chief Executive of Irrigation NZ, Elizabeth Soule took on the role as Regional Policy and Planning Manager in October 2020 before pursuing her own independent consultancy business. Prior to her time at Irrigation NZ, she worked as the Director of Strategy and Policy at the Waitaki Irrigators Collective, and prior to that as a Social Development Policy Advisor. Until recently, she sat on the Technical Committee of the International Alliance for Water Stewardship, based at Edinburgh. The Alliance aims to improve water-related outcomes across the globe through the setting of internationally agreed water stewardship standards. Elizabeth is currently working towards a PhD in Geography at Otago University, which focuses on past and present freshwater governance in New Zealand. It's my great pleasure to introduce you all to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, over to you. Kia ora koutou. thanks for having me. Um, I'm really pleased to be here to be able to talk to you this morning about irrigation and the environment. Um, it's a lot to cover, it's a, it's a big topic, um, and I only have a limited amount of time. So I've tried to keep my slides um, focused and um, really cover things sort of in a more general way, but I'm hoping that um, some of the issues that I raise uh, in my presentation, we might be able to discuss further in the um, question and answer session at the end. Um, so please, if there's something that you'd like to know more about, um, please ask the question. So next slide. I think uh, when usually when I give these sorts of presentations, I think it's really important to talk about where we've come from in terms of irrigation in New Zealand um, before we go on to looking at where we are now and where we might go in the future. Next slide. <clears throat> 
So um, one thing about irrigation in New Zealand is that it has been recognised as being important for um, our agricultural systems for a long time. So if you go back and look at um, newspapers from the, um, like this one's from 1867, the Otago Daily Times, there were widespread calls for investment in irrigation development because it was becoming aware that although we had um, amazing soils and a wonderful climate generally, we did have prolonged periods of drought. And it's interesting that in 1867, predictions were that the droughts were become, going to become more frequent and um, widespread. Next slide. And here's another example again from Otago. So this is the Otago witness um, in 1894, talking about um, the areas that were seen to be waste, treeless waste areas, which um, we probably wouldn't look at it through that lens today, given that they were um, naturally functioning ecosystems, but it did still um, demonstrate that there were people recognizing that we had a lot of potential um, and there were water sources that could be used to allow food and um, crop production. Next slide. So what happened was um, some of the first irrigation development in New Zealand was in Otago uh, when uh, water permits that were used for gold mining purposes were transferred over to be irrigation um, permits and here's an example of this was the headline what irrigation can do a fine crop of oats at Mount Pisa and this again was from the Otago witness in 1912. Uh, former Prime Minister Richard Seddon uh, who was a very famous uh, New Zealand politician for those um, offshore. He was a huge proponent of irrigation development um, as a means of social and economic development, but also as a means of producing food. So it was around this time that we started seeing widespread investment, particularly from the government, in irrigation development. Next slide. So for, for instance, here's a picture of the Ashburton Lyndhurst Irrigation Scheme main race being dug in Canterbury on the Canterbury Plains. Um, this was a photo from the press uh, newspaper in 1938. It's interesting, um, I'll, I'll come to this shortly, but there's a lot of, um, I think there's a common perception that irrigation, particularly in Canterbury, is a very new development. And um, I read some comments on a social media article, uh, on an article, um, on stuff, but they were comments that had been posted on social media. Last week it was around um, an irrigation scheme that had, and, and the comments were saying that the irrigation scheme had been built since um, Environment Canterbury underwent its um, governance overhaul um, in the, uh, around 2010. But in fact, the irrigation scheme that they were talking about was MHV, which has been um, around since the, since the 1930s, built with government money. And these aren't new developments. Irrigation has um, been part of the fabric of many of our communities in Canterbury and Otago for the best part of a century. Next slide. So here's a picture of when the um, Rangatata diversion race um, was being constructed. And as you'll see there, it says that the um, that water is now available for part of one of the three big mid Canterbury irrigation schemes. And this was um, this picture was from the 1940s. So irrigation was um, invested in by the government right through um, in terms of government construction by the Ministry of Works right through until the 1980s when schemes were largely privatised and sold to the farmer shareholders who were receiving water from them. Uh, they were particularly recognised as being a means of um, pro uh, providing employment opportunities during the construction phase. So we saw schemes being built in the 1930s, like the Rangatata Diversion Race, um, the uh, Redcliffe Scheme in South Canterbury as means of depression relief schemes to provide employment opportunities, both in construction, but also in the farms that would receive the water afterwards, because it would mean that their productivity was highly increased and it would mean that they could employ more people. Next slide. So thinking about um, transitioning from past practices to where we are today, uh, this is a photo from um, the press in 1934, and it was deemed to be a fine example of modern irrigation techniques. Um, it's, it's wild flooding, essentially. I'm not sure what that is that's being grown there. One of the farmers in the audience might be able to tell me. Um, but uh, it just goes to show that what we deem to be modern and efficient continues to change over time. And that's the same today as it was then. Next slide. 
So where are we now? What does irrigation look like in New Zealand at the moment? Next slide. So I've got a few infographics here that provide some context um, around irrigation in New Zealand and what it looks like. And I have to thank my um, former colleagues at Irrigation New Zealand for the um, infographics that they've provided. Um, so this one talks about New Zealand's water resources on a large scale. So the um, amount of total rainfall that New Zealand gets is quite high. So it's significantly more rainfall than the world average. As it says there, we are water rich. That does not mean that the water um, comes to the earth in ways that are always accessible for human uses or in places. Um, the phrase that gets used is the water isn't always in the right place at the right time, but that sort of that's only if you're looking at it through a human use lens, of course. Um, but we certainly have areas where um, we have prolonged periods of drought and um, parts of central Otago, North Otago and the Canterbury Plains um, in particular, where we have large bodies of water um, that particularly those that are fed from the alpine systems, uh, but the water isn't necessarily available for um, crop uptake unless you have irrigation. Next slide. So out of all that water that we that we receive, the 550 cubic kilometres, um, how much is used for human use? Well, it's about 2%. Uh, so you'll see there that 51% of that is used for irrigation. Uh, so the areas that have irrigation are obviously concentrated um, in specific parts of the country, but you'll see there that's where it's broken down. So this was back in 2016, but I don't think that the um, percentages have probably changed that much. Next slide. So as I mentioned, the um, dis distribution of irrigation across New Zealand um, is different depending on which region you're in. So these were the hectares under irrigation in 2017. So there will have been some change since this infographic was produced, but still the proportions are roughly um, still correct. So you'll see there that far and away the largest area for irrigation is Canterbury, followed by Otago. So the South Island really is the, the hub for irrigation in New Zealand, um, and that's where most of the um, development has occurred so far. Next slide. So this one, I'm sorry, it's a, it's, hopefully it's not too fuzzy, people can still read it. So what is irrigation used for in New Zealand? So you'll see there from the figures down the bottom that um, in terms of the irrigated hectares, 59% of that is dairy and dairy support, uh, which, is, which is acknowledged to be the main user of irrigation water. However, the infographics up the top there will demonstrate um, that how critical irrigation is for food production. 90% of New Zealand's um, vegetables are grown with irrigation and the majority of fruit and importantly wine and grain and cereal crops um, require irrigation. So it really is critical to um, New Zealand as a food producing nation and a protein um, producing nation that we um, have irrigation available to provide um, uh, surety for those food systems. Next slide. So if we look at how irrigation has changed over time, that slide that I had um, from 1934, 38, of what efficient irrig irrigation looked like back then compared to what it looks like now. So flood irrigation, um, it started with wild flooding and as um, Julia mentioned at the start, that changed over time to border dike. Now we have um, spray irrigation has become far and away the majority um, means of irrigation across the country and including um, a, a growing trend towards micro irrigation. So these systems are more efficient, as it says here, they can produce more crop per drop. And if you improve the efficiency of um, water application, you are likely to reduce drainage through the root zone. So therefore um, reduce the risk of nutrient losses into groundwater. So you'll see there that comparatively, New Zealand has 95% spray or drip irrigation with only 5% surface irrigation compared to the um, surface irrigation is 86% of the world's irrigation. So we are highly efficient in global terms, um, but that's not to say um, we can't always improve things and get more production from the water that we use. Next slide. 
So just in case there's people on the um, on the seminar that aren't um, don't aren't aware of some sorts of irrigation in New Zealand, I just thought I'd put a cup, put up a couple of pictures because they paint a thousand words. So this is an example of K-line irrigation, which are mobile pods um, that can be used. Um, it's a form of spray irrigation, but it's shiftable. Um, so it's and it's ideal for um, small areas where you cannot put, say, a centre pivot, um, or areas that are maybe have uneven ground. Um, where it's not possible to put put a pivot in. Next slide. This is an example of um, fixed grid irrigation system, which is um, relatively new development, which is becoming more and more um, common. So uh, these can either be used on their own or as supplementary to other irrigation system types, such as centre pivots, um, whereby each sprinkler is individually controlled um, so that it provides for highly efficient irrigation because it can be changed um, depending on uh, soil moisture, wind direction, um, crop requirements, that kind of thing. Next slide. And one of the sort of um, forgotten um, uses of irrigation water in New Zealand is for frost fighting. So this is really important to our horticulture and viticulture sectors. So um, putting water um, prevents um, frost damage to buds. Next slide. As you'll see in this picture, this is um, the use of irrigation for frost fighting at a um, vineyard in the Waitaki Valley. So this requires um, available, uh, high, reliable available water because it's unclear necessarily when a frost is going to hit. So there has to be water available to be able to um, protect the, the bud through that forming of ice around the um, bud, which prevents it from having frost damage. Next slide. But of course, there are pretty some pretty firm views on irrigation and um, its effects on the environment. So this is a, a um, Garrett Tremaine cartoon that appeared in the Otago Daily Times a few years ago now, um, but it still probably resonates with, with people. Next slide. And here's another example. I, th I think this was from, I think it was Greenpeace, I could be wrong, but this was from a few years ago. Um, it was a public awareness campaign that they did talking about big irrigation schemes, um, industrial dairying and spelling disasters for our rivers. So these are some of the um, public perceptions that the irrigation sector has been working really hard to try and counter, um, whilst acknowledging that there are environmental effects that come from intensive land use, absolutely, but there is a lot that's being done to try and manage and reduce those effects, and so I'll talk a wee bit about some of those now. Next slide. So in Canterbury, for instance, um, on the left there is, uh, is the cover of the industry agreed good management practices booklet, which has been produced um, in collaboration between Environment Canterbury and various primary sector organisations. So the, um, the movement in Canterbury is towards having all farmers operating at good management practice. And those practices are outlined in a narrative sense in, the, in that book, um, which is very comprehensive. And the new regulations in Canterbury under the Land and Water Regional Plan expect all farmers to be operating at GMP. Uh, one of the um, key things that the irrigation sector has been championing over the last uh, decade, if not more, has been um, irrigation schemes holding um, environmental management systems and comprehensive environmental policies under which their shareholders must adhere. Um, and a big component is that is farm environment plans, as you'll see there on the bottom right. That picture is not actually from New Zealand, it's from Canada and Ontario, but I think it actually it would be a really good idea if we could have so, those sorts of things on our farms um, as a way of publicising the work that our farmers are doing to public going past, particularly on State Highway 1. Um, to lessen their environmental footprint. So farm environment plans are um, to become compulsory as well under the Essential Fresh Water Policy Package, which the government um, recently released and will be um, being implemented over the next couple of years. Um, and so the, the farm environment plans really um, require uh, farmers to main, um, undertake good 
good management practices, but continually strive to improve those practices as well. So those um, farm plans will be written with the farmer to address um, farm specific environmental risks, critical source areas, that sort of thing, and then really tailor um, responses to those risks as management and mitigation options. And the farm plans will usually um, cover aspects such as soils management, riparian management, so that's waterway management, um, nutrient budgeting, um, if irrigation efficiency, um, so reducing um, drainage and also reducing runoff in hillier areas, uh, effluent management and that sort of thing. The picture on the top right there is of bucket testing. So that's a means of um, ensuring that irrigation um, systems on farm are operating as they should and to the most efficient um, uh, and, uh, meeting its efficiency requirements essentially to ensure that um, the water is going where it's meant to be and as much is going on as is meant to be going on. So those are the sorts of things that will be required under farm plans and they are externally audited um, and those audit results are reported back to um, the regulator in Canterbury's case that's ECAN or Environment Canterbury. So um, for as an example of that um, and I have to thank Eva at Irigo um, for providing me some of the some of this data. Um, the Bar Hill Chertsey Irrigation Limited has some data on their farm plan results. So when they started um, their program in place in the first um, season, their shareholders, 12% of their shareholders received um, C or D, so fail grades on their um, audits, and then um, only 12% were receiving an A. Um, which is good management practice or better. And then by 2018 season, um, that percentage of fails had, had reduced down to um, less than 2%, um, and 45% of their farmers were achieving an A grade, and 53% were, um, were receiving a B grade. So it's a really effective tool to improve practices over the time, over time. And as new um, practices um, are identified and new technologies, those can be incorporated within the farm plan and the environmental management system to ensure that practices change in accordance with improving technology. Um, irrigation schemes will also undertake things like comprehensive um, water quality monitoring and um, for instance, where I used to work in the Waitaki, um, the number of water quality samples that were taken in that catchment over the space of a year was around 1,000, and that was between um, six irrigation schemes. So there really are um, comprehensive processes in place to track environmental changes over time and then be able to um, change practices accordingly if that is required to address some of those um, water quality issues um, as they arise. There's also restrictions um, being placed um, because I think one of the perceptions is that irrigation in a way is kind of a free for all. So once you've got your water permit, you can um, do what you like with the water and the land um, um, under it, but which is really not the case. Um, under the essential fresh water package, there have been new national restrictions placed on intensification of land use. So for instance, um, there cannot be expansion of dairy under irrigation unless the um, landowner can demonstrate that there will be no increase in contaminant discharges from that property um, from prior to the development occurring um, until afterwards. Next slide. This is an example of the Irrikalk um, system. So this is what gets used to determine what is an um, uh, efficient um, amount of water to be used for irrigation. So this will get used um, around the country when people apply for a water permit to enable them to irrigate. And this will determine the um, amount of volume that is deemed to be reasonable based on the general rule of thumb as an 80% efficient irrigator. So it takes into account where in the country it is, the profile available water, so what, what water is readily available within the soil, um, then the system capacity and that sort of thing to determine um, what is a reasonable use. Uh, next slide. And um, irrigation or water use permits will always generally have irrigation, have restrictions on them as well. So when um, 
water levels in the water body that the water is taken from um, drop to um, a minimum flow or a, a go through a banding system, then irrigation either has to be restricted or turned off entirely. So this is an example of the irrigation restrictions um, website from Environment Canterbury. Um, and other regions have similar um, methods for um, monitoring um, and allowing people to, to manage their, their irrigation um, based on restrictions. And I think that um, one of the things that is potentially changing public perceptions, not about irrigation um, specifically necessarily, but about the importance of water infrastructure and water storage for our country is that restrictions are now being felt uh, by urban um, populations as well. So um, Auckland being the prime example, um, it, it's become very clear that uh, as climate change starts to bite, we are going to be having changed weather patterns. So not only will there be um, increased periods of drought, they are, they are going to be punctuated by increased um, flood events. And so we really need to think now about how we um, invest in infrastructure and manage our water better to enable all uses. Um, and so that's not just for human uses, but climate change is probably going to have some significant impacts on the way um, water bodies um, such as the East Coast um, um, streams and alpine systems behave because we'll see changes in precipitation from reduced snow potentially to increased um, rain events in winter. So the water bodies are themselves going to be under increasing pressure in, in um, drought periods. So that's going to have an effect on in-stream values such as ecological health, um, mahi kakai values. And so we really need to be thinking as a wider community, how we better manage our water infrastructure um, into the future. Next slide. And I'll just cut, touch quickly on a couple of um, emerging sorts of um, technologies um, and um, research uh, projects that are being undertaken to in, ensure that um, productivity continues to grow under irrigation as it has, but environmental um, management is, is similarly um, similarly increased. So this is an example of the Irrigation Insight Programme, which Irrigation New Zealand has been running with NIWA. Um, so this um, has piloted deep, um, deep soil moisture monitoring. So you can see there that the, that the blue section shows um, where the um, monitoring has occurred, um, and that's down to a depth of 80 centimetres. So it demonstrates um, when drainage occurs um, in relation to um, irrigation events and rain events and potential um, evaporation. So this, uh, this deep soil moisture monitoring was coupled with very fine grained weather forecasting that NIWA has the ability to undertake. And this was provided to farmers in um, catchment in North Canterbury um, to allow them to make really um, fine tuned irrigation decisions about when and how they irrigate. Um, and this has demonstrated that it greatly reduces drainage um, whilst improving productivity and has really improved farmer um, decision making in that catchment where that project has been ongoing. So that project finishes um, later this year, I believe. Next slide. And also there's going to be technologies on the horizon that we're that we don't know about yet. Um, this is an example of um, uh, a product out of the States called Dragonline, which converts centre pivots into drip irrigation by attaching these drip lines to them. Um, another example is uh, fertigation, which is a um, the uh, method of applying liquid fertilizer through irrigation equipment. And again, Irrigation New Zealand has been running a project um, to understand how that could work in the New Zealand context. It's very, uh, it's used quite extensively in places like the States, but tends to be used on cropping farms. It isn't widely used in um, pastoral settings like in New Zealand. So there's research going on to understand whether that would be, um, can be used well in the New Zealand context and what that does in terms of reducing um, uh, drainage and um, nitrate leaching um, as it's a very efficient form of fertilizer. And so it 
potentially reduces um, surplus in, in the pasture as well as in drainage. So um, that's the, if we go on to the next slide, that's the end of my presentation. Like I said, it's a, it's a difficult topic to cover in a short space of time because it is so broad. Um, but I'm hoping that we'll get some um, good questions and discussion to unpick some of those issues, perhaps in a bit more detail. Um, I will just say that I'm not an irrigation technology expert. My, um, my specialties lie in policy and governance. So if people have specific questions about irrigation technology, I would steer them in the direction of irrigation suppliers and Irrigation New Zealand because they have specialists who will hopefully be able to answer those questions better than I can. Thank you. That is absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Elizabeth. Uh, so a, a, an incredibly interesting and topical issue both here um, in Canterbury and around New Zealand. Um, and we've seen an, an increasing emphasis and importance being placed on nitrate losses. Um, and when a, I guess in a time where innovation and the words innovation and pivot have been used more than now than ever. Um, it's exciting to see what sort of innovative ideas um, are coming through as well. And I did notice um, as we we're leading up to this event about the Sustainable Irrigation Awards um, that have recently taken place um, to award responsible irrigation and innovative water management. So that's really exciting stuff um, that we're celebrating. Um, We've got a few questions um, that have come through Zoom. So I'm just going to bring those up now. Um, so if you've got any questions uh, for Elizabeth, just pop them into that question and answer box um, and I can put them forward. So we have got one here. What techniques would you recommend for retaining surface water in dry land farming landscapes with free draining soils? Um. So retaining surface water, uh, could, you, could you repeat the question? Just... Yeah. What techniques would you recommend for retaining surface water in dry land farming landscapes with free draining soils? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. And I'm, I'm thinking that that, is that that question might be specifically um, around uh, management, land management practices. I, I could be wrong. Um, and, and that's probably a, a technique technical kind of question that I'm not ideally suited to answer. Um, but I know that um, there is, you know, there has been research and work going on to look at methods of um, improving and enhancing productivity in dry land areas because they are going to become increasingly um, so under climate change. And that's where looking at things like um, deep rooting crops um, and um, things like, you know, going back to using lucerne and things like that um, are, are becoming more appealing. Um, but yeah, that's probably a technical agronomy type question. I don't know that, that I don't think I'm well pla best placed to answer, sorry. No, that's probably one, just as Elizabeth was saying before, to take um, back to the, the manufacturers or Irrigation mm. NZ and see, see what their sort of um, judgment is on that. Um, we've got one here, and I think you've touched on this a little bit, but maybe this is a bigger picture question. How do you think the use of irrigation on farm will change in the future? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, I think that we are going to be seeing, as I said earlier, greater and greater efficiency in terms of the use of the water that there is, because we are going to have to ensure that um, water is, particularly if we're looking for more, um, looking to invest greatly and more greatly in water storage. And that's not necessarily in forms of um, large dams and that sort of thing. But if we're looking at things like um, aquifer storage, which is a potential opportunity, um, we're going to make, those are very expensive options to take, but it's a reality that we are faced with. And so in order to be able to make the best use of that water that we've invested in, um, invested in capturing, we're going to have to make sure that we use it more and more efficient, efficiently. Um, as we've seen over time, uh, there have been huge shifts um, in terms of irrigation efficiency from flood um, to spray to micro to drip. Um, and, and that's going to continue as it not only allows for um, greater use of the resource, but um, there are significant production gains that can be made um, from that. 
um, we are more and more um, aware that we need to reduce um, our environmental footprint, footprint in terms of nitrate losses and irrigation drainage is a key um, part of that. So if we can reduce drainage by becoming more efficient, um, then that's the sort of thing that, um, that we need to be doing more and more of. There will be irrigation technologies um, that develop over time that we haven't even thought of now, and I suspect that they're going to come around relatively quickly, um, driven by the use of data, um, driven by the use of technology like satellite imagery and that sort of thing, um, to enable um, there to be really sort of fine-tuned precision techniques used. So not just at the farm scale, but you know, down to the paddock or sub paddock level to ensure that the irrigation water is going exactly where it's needed at exactly the right time. Cool, we've got a question here from Alex. There seems to be a lot of above ground application focus in terms of water distribution, efficiency and retention. Mm. Um, are there any studies being undertaken in New Zealand looking at the connection between soil below ground improvement and irrigation potential? Um, that's an interesting question. I, I don't know if there is at the moment, um, but I know, for instance, that there have been, um, for instance, a few years back when I was in Canada um, doing a research um, tour, they were looking at subsurface irrigation for potato um, crops as a means of reducing overland runoff because phosphorus trans, um, transportation into um, streams was a major concern for them there. Um, so those are the sorts of things that are being looked at in terms of making the water available from the for the plant at the uptake zone rather than applying it in terms of surface um, uh, application. Whether that's applicable in New Zealand is, is different. We have quite different sort of systems, particularly in Canterbury where we're pastoral based. Um, and that's why they're looking at um, investment and um, uh, research into things like fertigation um, that have been used overseas, but haven't necessarily been applied in the New Zealand context because our pasture systems are, are quite different. Um, so yeah, that's, that's certainly um, probably going to be a, um, a change to come, also given that the government has signaled that they um, want there to be um, focuses on horticultural production and an increase in um, high value um, crops. So it might be that irrigation um, techniques change if we are going to increase those areas of um, uh, horticultural and um, high value crop growth. Which, which probably leads us quite nicely into this next question here. Do you have any comment about the future of land use change um, under irrigation systems? Yeah, so, I mean, there's a big, it's, it's been signalled quite clearly, as I said earlier, under the essential freshwater package that the government wants to restrict particularly dairy development under irrigation. Um, and, uh, and, and, they are similar at the same time wanting to um, protect areas of highly productive land. Um, Pukekohe in South Auckland is a prime example of areas where there has been rapid urban development on prime horticultural land, which has really reduced the um, amount of um, our, the, the the, the hectareage of our highly productive land in New Zealand is small and it's shrinking rapidly. Um, and thankfully, one of the factors that the government proposed in their um, draft uh, national policy statement on high, pro pro protecting highly productive land was um, that one of the key factors of what defines highly productive land is accessibility and availability of water. Because as um, I showed in my slide earlier, that if you want to invest in horticultural development, you need water available um, because 90% of our vegetables, for instance, are grown with irrigation. So it's, it's unclear how much market forces in terms of um, New Zealand's um, land use and development, will how much market forces in terms of our global um, marketplace position will change things relative to government um, driven 
decision making through regulations it's probably going to be a bit of both but for instance you know the, the massive dairy development that's happened in Canterbury has been as a response to um, the global um, marketplace in which our New Zealand farmers operate so that's likely to have an impact in the future um, I'm I'm not a futurist um, or a commodities person so what that will be I'm not sure but it's certainly there's multiple factors that are going to influence our land use in the future Excellent. We've got um, another question here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. How do you think continued irrigation and irrigation development can align with te mana o te wai? Mm, that's a great question. Um, so te mana o te wai, um, for those of the court on the seminar that might not know, is it is um, a concept that has been um, put into regulation through the um, latest iteration of the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management. So te mana o te wai is a series of um, principles. Um, the, the key one being that the health of the waterway comes first, and that is to be reflected um, in regional authority so regional council planning um, frameworks so for instance all all regional councils have to implement new regional policy statements and regional plans within the next two years that um, and then they become operative another couple of years after that that implement the principles of te mana o te wai which includes things like putting the health of the waterway first um, kaitiakitanga guardianship and other um, the other principles of it which I don't have off the top of my head so really if we are to have future irrigation development they will have to align with the principles of te mana o te wai um, and I think that um, what te mana o te wai is in each region is going to be different depending on um, iwi, depending on the runanga, depending on the shared values of the communities within each region. Um, but I think that the, that the irrigation sector is actually well placed to be able to um, um, meet some of those challenges that are potentially going to be presented by this new framework that we'll be working under um, because of the systems that they've put in place like environmental management systems, the farm environment plans. Um, environment Canterbury have already taken a step um, in this direction by having compulsory mahinga kai values um, incorporated within um, farm plans where they are compulsory in Canterbury. Um, so those are the sorts of things that we're probably going to be seeing more of. And as I talked earlier about the, um, the effects of climate change, they are going to have significant effects on in-stream values, which are going to affect, um, affect the range of values. Um, so including cultural health, including the health of the waterway, regardless of the human um, uses of those. And so I, I do wonder, this is just my personal opinion, whether we need to be incorporating the, concepts like water storage um, into how we protect ecological health in the future, not just in terms of providing water for human uses, um, because if we are to protect our indigenous biodiversity, um, particularly in our aquatic systems, then they're going to need some help um, given the, the climate change scenarios that we're faced with. Cool. We've got a question here from Murray uh, how has the government's management of irrigation schemes changed over recent years and what has driven that? Um, so, um, like I said earlier, the irrigation, many of the irrigation schemes in New Zealand um, up until the 1980s were um, built by the Ministry of um, Works um, and they um, managed um, the infrastructure um, alongside the old catchment boards um, that would have government, um, they had their own employees um, and they would um, manage the irrigation systems alongside the farmers. Those were privatised um, and sold to the farmer shareholders as they are now who receive the water from the schemes. Since the 80s though, irrigation development in New Zealand has been um, generally um, a pro been private developments funded through a mix of funding sources but primarily from the um, shareholder farmers who receive water from the schemes. Uh, there are some areas where there still is um, government participation in irrigation um, but generally it's through local government rather, from, rather than through central government. Um, the, the previous governments um, the last national government had um, invested in irrigation development 
um, through the Crown Irrigation Investments Limited, which was a means of crowding in investors, outside investors into irrigation um, scheme development. Um, and it, it was an investment, they were, they were loans that were um, attracted commercial interest rates. So these weren't um, subsidies or grants um, in, the, in that sort of sense. So it certainly changed over time. And now we are in the position where there is um, no, uh, essentially no government um, investment in irrigation schemes per se, although um, there are opportunities for irrigation um, schemes um, and um, land users to um, receive government um, support through things like the Sustainable Farming Fund to look at um, research invest and investment in um, new technologies and um, new sustainable farming um, methods. So it really has changed from being sort of a fully, um, fully um, embedded um, the government was a was a strong actor in the irrigation sector to now being extremely hands off, except through regulations which have become um, more and more stringent and complicated over the last sort of um, 10 to 20 years. Cool. Um, a, a good lead in here. We've got a, a question here from Dennis. How does the governance and management of irrigation schemes compare to the three waters sector, given the intensive work by the Infrastructure Commission and others? I think I know the dentist that asked this question. Um, yeah, so um, interestingly, one of the um, criteria for um, funding under that Crown Investment um, Infrastructure Program was around governance of irrigation schemes. So the, it, it used to be that when the, when the irrigation schemes were first privatised, the, um, the governance would be a board of directors who were elected from farmers. Um, and they made up the entirety of the board. There has um, recently, as governance, um, you know, theory has become more developed and the schemes have become more complex in terms of their um, infrastructure as they've invested heavily in um, technology, their infrastructure has become more complex and dynamic um, in terms of the, its management requirements. Um, and the complexities and risk associated as well with modern governance has meant that they have um, the, the, the governance sector within the irrigation sector has become a lot more sophisticated. Um, the, uh, irrigation New Zealand have done a lot of work over the years um, improving governance practices, um, partnering with the Institute of Directors, for instance, to um, upskill the governors of irrigation schemes. So we're at the point now where irrigation schemes will often have independent directors, they're seeking to diversify their boards, they will often have financial and legal specialists um, on their boards. Um, and that is quite different to the um, three waters sector, um, which uh, in terms of stormwater, wastewater, um, drinking water, which have still largely been um, uh, owned and governed by local government and where they have been devolved they've that there's sort of been more of a community-based um governance structures in place they haven't um they haven't needed or been required to um really uh, put a, a lot of time investment and education into um into governance and that's an interesting sort of thing to think about given that the government is now um investing in a major overhaul of the three water sector, um, particularly around drinking water and improving drinking water safety across country with the water services bill that was introduced um, into parliament last year and um, the formation of Taumata Arawai, the national drinking water regulator. So there's big changes coming in that, that half of the water sector. Cool. Um, we've got time for a few more questions. So if you've got any pressing questions, please feel free to pop them in the question and answer button there. Um, there is a question here from Lee, and I noticed, Lee, um, you've got a few few people that have um, offered some insight here. So um, Lee is asking about, um, and the, this is the technical term, the mm. drip irrigator thingy. 
uh, from the USA that you showed in the slide. <laughs> yep. um, unlikely to be suitable for dairy pasture. Um, he understands it's a techie question, mm. but um, wonders if you have any idea what the efficiency or inefficiency of a centre pivot watering pasture in Canterbury in the middle of a Norwester is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So first half of that question. Yes. Um, so that uh, the dragon line technology, that was just an example that I put up. Yes, that that's used where it is used. It's generally for um, cropping purposes. So not necessarily for dairy pasture, um, except that. Um, but it was just an interesting example, I thought. Um, in terms of efficiency of a pivot during a howling nor'wester, yes, um, obviously there will be um, a reduction in efficiency, if I can put it that way, in, in a, a pivot that's being used in strong winds on a hot day. Um, I guess that the issue with the nor'westers that we experience in Canterbury and Otago is that you're forever playing catch up um, and it's, it, it, it becomes critical at certain times of the year when there is those those winds coming through it's really hard to keep soil moisture levels at a, at a good level um, and interestingly the Waitaki Valley is an example um, it used to be a dust the dust bowl of New Zealand you know um, there would frequently have dust storms that would ravage the the valley and the Hakataramae is another example when the nor'westers would come through irrigation has basically has meant that that um, no longer happens and the windborne erosion and the transportation of phosphorus as a result has re reduced significantly and it's because of irrigation. Um, so yeah, irrigation during a nor'wester is a, is a significant challenge, except that, yes. And I notice uh, Katie's actually, Katie Nimmo has um, commented back um, that the Hydro Eco Group at UC have done some work on this. Um, and to contact Professor Tom Cochran for more info. Great. Um, and Alex has also said um, that there is uh, some information on Dragon, uh, Dragon Line as well. So uh, ah, feel free okay. to check those out, Lee. Uh, let's get to the next one here. Uh, one from David. What policy measures or initiatives are in place to have this critical discussion with the 90% of New Zealanders who are urban? Um, yeah, that's that's an interesting um, that's an interesting question. Um, the urban population is um, sorry. I'll go back a step. Irrigation New Zealand undertook some surveys a few years ago, and um, they focused on urban populations to understand their perceptions of irrigation. And interestingly, a lot of those populations, particularly in Wellington and Auckland were not opposed to irrigation at all. They understood it completely and why it was necessary, why we need it for food production um, and how important it is for our rural economies and the social um, aspect, the social improvements that that brings. Um, but it was the concern about um, the effects of irrigation in terms of environmental footprint and also um, concern that there was a, a bit of a, a perception that farming wasn't necessarily being undertaken in the most modern and efficient ways. And so um, I think that's where sort of that, if I can call it a disconnect comes in, it's that there's an acceptance broadly of the concept, but there's a sort of a lack of understanding of the effects um, and the, the things within the system that are, that are happening to, to improve um, systems over time. One thing that um, we did at Irrigation New Zealand when I was there is we undertook um, uh, an a event, if you want to call it that, called a virtual field trip, um, where we um, went out, um, visited some irrigation, an irrigation scheme, um, irrigating farmers, and talked to them live um, on the internet um, about what they do and why they do it. And then we had live question and answer sessions as well with um, primary school students. And um, we had hundreds of students from across New Zealand participating in this virtual field trip. And a lot of them came from urban centres, which was really good because it meant that um, they couldn't necessarily come to the Canterbury Plains if they're in Auckland um, to find out what happens um, at, a, at, at the farm level. But they were able to interact with through, through that um, 
through that virtual classroom experience. And we had some fantastic questions and amazing questions coming from the kids. They had some really insightful things to ask. And actually some of the strange questions um, came from some of the teachers, which was quite interesting actually. Um, but uh, I think that we probably need to think about how we can do more of that sort of thing because um, through education um, is where we're going to have some gains. And I don't think that we necessarily can rely on the government to do that for us. Um, the primary sector as a whole needs to, um, needs to engage with the, with the urban population to address the concerns that they have because they, they come from a place of genuine concern. And so we need to acknowledge that and be able to answer and provide honest responses to those questions. Absolutely, we've got um, a question here. We've got time for a couple more questions. Um, so anything pressing, just pop that into the Q&A box. One from Terry, what do you see as the impediments to progress the role of water infrastructure in addressing climate change impacts across the board? Mm. Great question. Um, so there's a number of um, things that I think we need to better um, address before we're going to be able to move ahead with investing in irrigate with water infrastructure. Um, we need to think about water infrastructure as um, it. I heard a quote once that it's not water infrastructure is not something that you solve once. Um, you have to be solving it continuously. So we need to. We, in, as a country, we invested heavily in water infrastructure in the mid 20th century, um, and we seem to have stopped. Um, and now we're having to do it again, which is extremely expensive. So um, we, and like I said earlier, that the issues that, have, that Auckland has been facing have really demonstrated the importance of water for all parts of the community. So the question around water storage, it shouldn't be driven by just one sector within the, um, you know, one sectoral voice. It really needs to be embraced by all parts of the community. The Waimea Dam um, in Nelson is a really good example where that water um, that's going to be provided by that dam is not just for irrigation, but over half of that is owned by the um, district council because um, there is a great need for reliable water for the, um, for the citizens in the in receiving domestic supply and industrial supply as well. So we need to ensure that we're taking the conversation beyond just water storage for farmers, for instance, but actually where can we invest in water infrastructure as a nation um, to enable multiple benefits? And those benefits because they are spread across the community, then the costs associated with building, investing and running that infrastructure need to be similarly spread. Um, so I think that there, we need to think about some new ways of investing in infrastructure that aren't either private or public at either end of the spectrum and instead um, somehow bring those together. One thing that I've, that I'm quite passionate about as well is that we need to have an overarching water strategy for New Zealand. Um, we have policy responses around um, water quality as we've seen through the essential fresh water package. Um, the government has signaled that it wants to um, relook at water allocation in terms of quality and quantity and what the allocation framework looks like. That's also going to be affected by the Resource Management Act reforms that are going to be going ahead in the next couple of years too. And then we talk about water infrastructure and water storage in terms of climate change response. And then we talk about free waters, which is stormwater, wastewater and drinking water. And those are all treated as separate policy um, issues when in actual fact, we should be having a strategy that guides all of those decisions because they all in, um, affect one another. So I, th I, I personally think that we need an overarching national um, framework that's going to be guiding these decisions over time so that we can best um, look at where we need to invest and how we invest and how we can improve multiple um, outcomes whilst taking into account things like te mana o te wai, which was talked about earlier because you know, New Zealand is water rich, um, and, but we'd, we're going to be required to um, manage our water better and better as time goes on.
we've got a question here from uh, Dean. The numbers you put up re global irrigation systems uh, pressurized to be flood were surprising. What mm. do you think, why do you think flood is still more prevalent and which countries are doing the most to move uh, to a more efficient pressurized system? Mm. So um, some of those systems will be, will incorporate things like rice production, um, which uh require flood irrigation um by the nature of the requirements of rice crop um so, so that's why um that figure is probably so high um there is um constant um there's a lot of work being done um around the globe to improve um irrigation and drainage issues um the um there's a lot of um research um, undertaken in places like the states um, to in, to increase um, production with efficient irrigation techniques, um, and Australia has invested heavily in um, improving efficiency at a um, delivery level. Um, through, and a lot of that has been driven by the um, uh, changes to the um, regulatory framework around the Murray Darling. Basin, um, given that they had their the millennial the millennium drought, um, and had to respond to that, so that the Australian government has invested heavily in buying back water um, within that system to leave it in rivers, and then also um, improving uh, scheme efficiency. For instance, investing heavily in lining uh, irrigation races um, and that sort of thing to um, and it's one thing that, that the New Zealand government doesn't do is invest directly in um, improving um, irrigation scheme efficiency and that sort of thing, which has been done overseas extensively. Um, but I would suggest that um, looking at the, there's an international commission on irrigation and drainage, and that's based in India. And um, that's that does a lot of work um, bringing together thought leaders from around the world around irrigation and how it can be, how it can be improved. Uh, Simon's got a question here, um, probably got time for, for these last two here. Simon said, I was told 20 odd years ago that the Canterbury aquifers were already 30% oversubscribed for irrigation, but development has continued. What's yeah. the current understanding of our supply reliability from um, aquifers in Canterbury today? Yeah, so I know that um, one of the um, things that, if I think about the Central Plains um, um, irrigation, development as an example, one of the reasons that went ahead was to enable the retirement of um, uh, takes from aquifers. Um, so reducing groundwater takes and um, uh, replacing those with more um, um, reliable surface water takes to um, reduce the pressure on aquifers. Um, there is, uh, um, Environment Canterbury has um, put in place um, increasingly um, restrictive uh, when irrigation permits are being replaced, the um, conditions placed upon them are more and more restrictive than they were previously. Um, so, uh, for instance, they have policies where um, if a person is seeking a water permit um, for whether that's from groundwater or a surface water body, and there is um, irrigation scheme water available, um, they'll, they have a policy that that will be taken into account in the decision-making process for that water permit. And certainly these, the work of the zone committees have looked at um, ways of elite, reducing um, groundwater takes by uh, uh, replacing those with surface water um, wherever possible. And a lot of the efficiency gains that we've seen in Canterbury through the investment, um, through in investment in things like efficient technologies, um, variable rate ir irrigation, and switching from flood to um, spray irrigation has been um, because of the um, pressure that was being put on um, systems and that was acknowledged um, and uh, the, the, the increasing need to produce more crop per drop. I, I don't have the figures in terms of allocation from Canterbury aquifers off with me at the moment, so I can't answer that specifically. Um, but yeah, I hope that kind of answers the question. Cool. And one last one here. We've got how does um, 
increase in efficiency of irrigation change water quality of surface water bodies. Is there a correlation between water dikes to spray irrigation to increase or decrease in water quality? Yeah, that's that's an excellent question as well. So um, what, what one of the things that's happened on the Canterbury Plains that people are very concerned about is the increase in nitrates. The one of the somewhat ironic things that happens when shifting from border dike to spray irrigation, for instance, is that because you have less water moving into the aquifer, um, you have less attenuation of the nutrients there, so dilution essentially, um, because you have less water volume overall. So we saw at the same time as increasingly efficient irrigation systems, there was intensification of land use. So those two things coupled together meant that we saw an increase in nitrates. Um, that again, the, the, uh, there are significant um, things being undertaken by irrigation schemes and, and irrigated farmers to try and reduce their drainage so therefore reduce the number of the amount of nutrients going through, um, both in terms of absolute volume, but concentration, which is critical too. Uh, there is work being done on managed aquifer recharge um, uh, in the Hakio Hines Plains area to uh, reduce the effects of concentrations of nitrates by putting water back into the aquifer um, to ensure that there's a dilution. The effect of um, uh, losses through the through the root zone onto surface water. Um, well, the effect of nutrient losses on surface water can can occur in two ways. One is if the groundwater where it comes up in springs and feeds into surface water bodies, if that if there are increased um, nutrient uh, or contaminant loads. Um, concentrations within those springs then it gets carried into surface water bodies or it can go through direct overland flow particularly in hillier areas where you have surface um, flows into into surface water bodies so depending on where you are um, like I mentioned earlier farm environment plans are tailored for a specific farm so their environmental risk factors will be assessed so if their risk profile is around drainage then that's what that farm plan will be focused on if their um if their risk is around overland runoff, um, then that's what their um, that's what their uh, farm plan will be focused on is, is around mitigating those risks. So absolutely, there. Are, I mean, that's a reason that um, irrigation schemes in Canterbury, some of them now have nutrient discharge allowance caps on their consent. So essentially, they have a a maximum amount of particularly nitrogen that is um, can be modelled to be um, um, leached from those farms and so the scheme cannot go over that cap and so that's managed through the farm environment plan process as, as well. So there are multiple um, steps being taken to try and address those issues. Excellent, thank you so much for that Elizabeth. We've had so many questions come through and we just can't get to all of them. So are you? do you have a way that maybe people can contact you if they, they have a pressing question or they want to speak to you further about it? Um, yes, absolutely. So um, I can, I've got um, email is the best way to contact me. Yep. Um, so my email address is ejcsoal, there it is there, at icloud.com. Excellent. Um, sorry to those questions that we haven't managed to get around to. We've just had so many, it's crazy. Um, we have had an amazing event today. It's been fantastic. A massive thank you so much to our guest speaker, Elizabeth, for your time and your insight. Um, we've had so many requests over the last 12 months to hear from you. So we are incredibly thankful for you to um, join us this morning. Um, we are really looking forward to seeing everyone back in the B-Link workshop for the next event as part of our innovation series, The Future of Fibre. Um, we will hear from two different industry experts as well um, as a vet who will deliver some insights around nutrition and its role in fibre as well. Um, we've also got our next event in, the, in our VIBE series, which is Fast Approaching Facilitating Sustainable Development for Canterbury. We will hear um, from our guest speaker, Tim Davey, who's ECAN's Director of Science, um, so might be of, of interest to those who are participating today as well. This will be an in-person event uh, where we'll not only benefit from hearing about what ECAN are up to, but also what they've got planned for the upcoming year.
you can register for your ticket from blinkinnovation.com or straight from Eventbrite. Uh, if you're interested in keeping up to date with our future events, please make sure to subscribe to our upcoming events calendar on our website. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, terribly sorry we haven't managed to get through all of these questions, but hopefully some people will reach out and you can continue those discussions um, offline. But really appreciate you joining us today and thank you very much everyone for coming along as well. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you.